links will be posted to uh, our website once the once the session is over. All right. So um, a little bit different uh, agenda today. Typically, we have our presentation from Glenn and Kate, and then a Q and A. Uh, today, we have a bunch of uh, uh, topics to cover. So we have a series of short presentations that you can see on the screen. We're going to start with pract uh, gardening practices and then talk about specific issues that um, that we've been mentioning briefly throughout each of the previous uh, talks and then some new issues like pests, garden pests, and beneficial insects. So with that, Glenn is first up. He'll be talking about good gardening practices. And if you're ready, Glenn, um, go ahead and, uh, and share your screen. So this is just a, a little bit of an introduction to talk about what are good gardening practices so that uh, you're effective and, and don't hurt yourself, which is something you have to think about because not that gardening is all that hazardous, but there's things to do that can keep you in good shape. So uh, one of the first things that I recommend is uh, organize your tools and get them in one spot. So it's really great if you have your small tools in a container. Uh, so when you're working, you have a spot where you put everything so you aren't looking all over the place for them. And it's easy to lose your tools in the garden. Uh, most of us are sort of uh, thinking about other things sometimes and we're doing more routine kind of practices like weeding. So uh, then we get interrupted and we leave things. So always kind of have your, your hand tools in one spot and go to them and put them down near that spot. Uh, they don't have to necessarily go in the container if they're dirty, but have them nearby so that you have them collected and in one place. Uh, spare your body. So don't try to, to carry heavy things long distances. Use a wagon or a wheelbarrow uh, because it's very easy to injure your back, especially like a big sack of compost that weighs 25 or 30 pounds. That's enough to really do it if you bend over uh, to pick it up. First of all, if you're gonna pick it up, bend your knees and kind of squat to pick it up and use your knees for power. Don't use your back because backs are fragile. They're not really designed to, to keep doing heavy lifting over and over again. If you're gonna be down on the ground, protect your knees with pads or something padded uh, because all it takes is one little rock, you get a bruise on your knee and you're gonna hurt for the rest of the week. So you, you're more inclined to, to work longer if you're comfortable. And I've learned also flexible gloves that allow for good dexterity are a great idea. Um, so those are really trippy looking gloves there. I don't have a pair like that, but uh, it, the point is, is that keep the dirt out, out from under your fingernails and, and keep your skin from cracking. And uh, especially when you're weeding and things, it's really nice to have gloves on for that or for lifting things. Plan your time. This is really one of the toughest things I think for all of us is that you have to allow for time for setup and putting things away, uh, you know, whatever you're planning, quit a little bit sooner. So what I taught landscape contracting with a, a, a co-professor at, at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And we always talked about, you have to figure you, you have an hour for setup, six hours to work, and then one hour to clean up water and put things away. So that kind of gives you an idea that about a third of your time, or a quarter of your time should be spent on, on, on setting up and then picking up. And uh, don't try to, to make it so that you're really rushed for time. Another thing that's very, very important is that try to visit your garden daily, if only for a brief period. Do a little weeding and make sure no one is drying out or getting attacked by a pest or a disease. So no garden is a no maintenance garden. You need to pay attention to what's going on and react. You wouldn't put something on the burner on the, on the stove and walk away and it's sort of the same with the garden. This is one of the toughest things is we all get excited, but then we also get busy. Uh, and what I find happening, especially in the warmer parts of, of uh, our region is that as the season goes on, you really have to pay attention to watering and looking after things. And we tend to get a little bit tired of the heat and we don't go outside as much as we do, but, but try to be really mindful about taking care of it. Uh, so we'd like to say the best fertilizer is the gardener's footprints. And uh, it's really important to show up and be there. Don't get overheated. So start your work early in the morning and get done before it gets hot for those of you who live in warm places. 80 degrees Fahrenheit is the threshold for worker safety practice practices for commercial growers. So at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, they have to start rolling out the shade and uh, giving the workers breaks. And take breaks in the shade, rest for 10 minutes and hydrate. Uh, you know, if you're prone to cramps like I am, use some electrolyte mixes in the water and uh, make sure that you're, you're drinking because you can get very uncomfortable and, and ill if you don't replace uh, water that uh, you're sweating. So 
that's very important. So these are just some little guidelines for you to kind of help make your gardening more enjoyable. And, and I think that there are important safety practices as well. So that's the first section. Okay, so now we're gonna turn it over to Greg Juicy to talk a little about vertebrate pests. Thank you, Glenn. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry I don't have PowerPoint illustrations to share with you. Unfortunately, my hard drive crashed this morning when I was setting up. So uh, keeping a theme of vertebrates, I'm gonna be winging this, though I don't have any feathers. Um, I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about the, probably the three main vertebrates, animals with backbones that tend to give gardeners um, challenges. Uh, the three species are one is a pocket gopher. Uh, second one are moles with an M. And the third one are voles with a V. Pocket gophers and voles are rodents, while moles with an M are insectivores. Um, insectivores, as the name implies, are meat eaters. And uh, moles essentially do their damage in search of their prey items, which are earthworms and grubs and the like. Rodents, on the other hand, have a need to manage their big teeth in the front, the incisors. And so they, in, and which grow throughout their entire life, in order for them to manage tooth growth, they have to chew on things, they have to gnaw on things. And so they may uh, choose a young apple tree or a young pear tree or some other woody plant not necessarily to eat it, but to uh, manage their tooth growth and to wear their teeth down. From an ecological point of view, all three species feed the world. They're important prey items for a number of avian and, and terrestrial uh, predators. They, uh, they, share, they share space. They all live underground. The term for that is they are fossorial, uh, spending most of their time underground, but not all. Moles, with an M, will spend almost their entire time below ground. If one is above ground, it's, it's not doing well. While voles uh, will go below ground to rest and to seek shelter, but do all their foraging above ground. Pocket gophers can do both. They will uh, eat below ground portions of a plant, but they'll also come above ground and uh, graze uh, like a sheep would on, on grasses and herbs. None of these species hibernate, so they are active throughout the year. Um, in the case of all of them, they have very fast metabolic rates. Moles would be the fastest, probably 400 to 400 heartbeats a minute, which means that they have to eat a lot of protein all the time, hence their constant movement looking for earthworms and grubs. Um, the opportunity for damage uh, in gardens is enhanced because most gardeners are doing things to their soil that make it easier for animals that live underground to move about. Uh, if you have a high organic content, uh, your soil tends to be light and fluffy. You can imagine an animal that's digging underground would appreciate your efforts in having loosened soil. The key for all of them is that the soil must maintain a tunnel. Uh, if the soil is too friable, is too loose and collapses, well, then that's not in favor of those animals. But I think most of us, even if we rototill down below the ties of the rototill, the soil is probably going to be uh, of a nature and of a structure that's going to maintain a tunnel and allow these animals to move around. One of the most common questions I got over the course of my career is, how do I know if I have a mole? How do I know if I have a gopher? Uh, the best way to tell, and I'm sorry I was going to show this, uh, illustrate this with an image, but if I can describe it to you, a mole mound looks as if a child came along with a little tiny wheelbarrow and just dumped a pile of dirt. Uh, it's a volcanic or conical shaped pile of dirt. There's no visible tunnel entrance uh, because all of the dirt is pushed up very much like lava coming out of a volcano. It's being pushed up by the animal from underground and it falls upon itself and creates this volcanic or chronic shaped mound of dirt. A pocket gopher on the other hand actually exposes its body when it's um, excavating its tunnel, uh, pushing the dirt out of the tunnel using its body, using its forearms and its chest. And so when the animal is done, uh, it backs up and closes up the, uh, the burrow entrance. So is 
the burrow entrance on a gopher mound is very visible. You could see the plug tends to be a little, the mound tends to be more flattened because the animal is going over the top of the dirt as it's excavating its burrow. Uh, and it tends to be crescent shaped. But the key is if you can see that plug, if you can see where the burrow entrance is, then that's a pocket gopher burrow. Voles, on the other hand, uh, never plug their burrow entrance. So if you see holes, and they're, they're incredibly social animals, uh, usually living in, in small family units. So if you see a cluster of, of small holes about the size of a golf ball, maybe slightly larger, and they're never plugged, uh, chances are you've got a little vole colony there. If you're in your garden and you find just a single open hole uh, and, and you have no idea what it is, gently pour some water down that hole. Chances are you'll have a western toad come out of that hole. Uh, but again, those are usually single and um, where voles are, uh, are more colony uh, inhabitors. If you have raised beds, you can take care of all of them by lining the raised beds with quarter inch galvanized hardwire cloth. End of story. I mean, it's that easy for the most part. Uh, but, but putting some kind of physical barrier below your soil matrix inside the borders of the raised bed can, uh, can effectively eliminate any, uh, any risk of, of damage from any of these, these animals that live below ground. Um, if uh, an organic approach that most gardeners use, if, if uh, you have to rid your garden of, of these animals is to use some kind of trap. I, I am not in favor of, of backyard gardeners using toxic baits. Uh, I think it adds a, an unnecessary risk. Uh, you know, you're exposing pets and children and, and perhaps even poultry to, um, to toxic baits. You have issues of storage. So I generally try and talk people out of using, but they are available. I'm telling you this because you can go to a, a retail nursery and find these materials on the, on the shelves. Uh, personally, I, I try and steer people away from that. I think um, if, if you need to remove the animal, uh, using a Maccabee trap or a cinch trap, C-I-N-C-H. Uh, you know, we have so much information at our fingertips these days. Simply YouTube, uh, Maccabee traps, YouTube, cinch trap placement, and it'll give you step-by-step -step instructions uh, on how to place these. And you have to remember, you know, trapping is not a scientific effort. It's, it's an artful effort. It takes practice, and some people are very good at it. Some people struggle with it. But uh, it can be an effective way to remove an animal, a gopher or a, a mole uh, from your garden, though trapping moles is not easy. I'll, I'll be the first one to admit it. I'm not very good at it. Um, but with persistence, sometimes I get lucky. Um, Again, the challenge is that as gardeners, we do the best we can to improve the tilt and health of our soil, and consequently, that makes it attractive to uh, these particular vertebrates. Um, but again, I hope this has you know been helpful, giving you giving you some thoughts on uh, these these um, common backyard inhabitants. And uh, good luck gardening. Good time of year to be out and enjoying the sun. Awesome. Thank you. I'm gonna, real quick. He has a couple more minutes. So I'm going to put uh, a picture up of the mole versus gopher pockets just so people can see what he was talking about. Sorry, we didn't have, have a slide. Yes. Yeah. No, that's good. Thank you. Uh, and people might yeah. say, why does he keep calling them pocket gophers? Uh, pocket go I call them pocket gophers because uh, in California, our gophers, our common backyard gopher, have these external fur lined cheek pouches. They're saddlebags. And uh, the animal can actually uh, chew on your plants and stuff these external cheek, cheek pouches uh, with food. And that allows the animal to walk back in its burrow to its cache and uh, store these food items for a, a later time. If some of you listening are from other parts of the country, you know, in Florida, people refer to gophers as um, land tortoises. And in the Midwest, pot, uh, gophers are usually referred to as um, what we would call ground squirrels. So out here in California, just to distinguish, um, I, I don't know where people are listening from, I use the term pocket gopher, though mommy's bote is, botanic, or is the uh, scientific name. Uh, if you look it up, you know, you can see, get a picture of them, you see these uh, fur-lined cheek pouches that they use to carry food uh, back and forth under their tunnels. Awesome. Well, that was great, thank you so much.
Glenn, are you ready to move on to uh, irrigation? So irrigation is something that's necessary because part of the year we sort of live in a desert, the rain quits and then it gets dry and uh, the moisture will eventually come out of the soil. And about this time of the year, we need to start watering. And you might remember from the first lecture where I talked about uh, components of an ideal soil by volume, and is that we should have an equal part of air and water in this kind of porous media. And in other words, soil isn't solid, it's actually porous like a sponge. And we talk about kind of three critical moisture points. One is saturation, that's right after you irrigate where all the pores are filled with water. There's no oxygen, so we don't wanna keep this going on for a long time. Ideally, things should drain fairly quick, but yet we should have some water left behind. And what the soil can hold is called field capacity. And the water in the soil can be held against gravity and there's a certain amount of, of uh, kind of, of suction that the soil exerts and we call this minus one third bar or minus one third of an atmosphere. And uh, it's, it's actually physically holding water against gravity by, by uh, uh, a thing called capillary action. We don't have time to go into detail about that. But it's sort of like a straw. You know how water goes up a straw and it'll actually, uh, the water level on the straw is higher than it is in the, in the, the glass that it's in. And it's sort of the same thing with soil, it's, that's capillary action. When 50% uh, of the water's been used up, it's at minus one bar. And what we find about water uh, and plants using it is that the first water it can take off very, very easily. And as it, time goes on, the, it gets tougher and tougher for the plant to uh, draw water out because it's being held tighter and tighter by the soil. So if we can keep everything between minus one third bar and minus one bar, that's in that really happy place where you're about 25% air, 25% water and, and the rest is solids. So we do have tools that you can actually uh, check this with and commercial growers use these things, they're called tensiometers and they, they read in, in uh, uh, centibars on a scale between usually zero and 100. So, so right here, you can see that uh, the water level is okay, but as you get close to 100, then it's gonna get to be uh, tougher for the plant. And that's usually when you read uh, waters, when you get close to minus one bar or 100 uh, centibars, and then that will uh, uh, allow you to keep the, the root uh, moisture in a really good place and your plants will grow very, very well. And uh, unstressed plants really grow the best. So we like to irrigate so the soil's not too dry or too wet. So drip irrigation's uh, really pretty the perfect way to do it. And a little bit of every day works well in hot places and sandy soils. I recommend mulching to prevent the soil surface from drying out and check the soil moisture with a trowel, screwdriver, or tensiometer if you want to get high tech. And whenever possible, use a timer if you can. So that's kind of my brief introduction. Kate's gonna talk a little bit more about actually setting up systems and managing them. Glenn, you wanna just kind of skip ahead and talk about other pests if you're ready to do that? That way we can come back to Kate when she's- Yeah, we can do that. Slugs and snails. So we'll talk about those a little bit. Uh, th these are, are problematic pests, usually centered around moisture and cooler times of the year is when we see them. So if you're on the coast, you're always dealing with them. Uh, in the interior, they tend to be more like the spring and winter problems. And uh, they're very destructive. So they have chewing mouth parts and they, they eat big holes. So if you walk out in your garden, you're seeing big holes in the, the plant. It's probably something with chewing mouth parts. And the two most likely uh, pests would be caterpillars or snails and slugs. So they're mostly nocturnal. That's usually when you see them because they, uh, they need to be cool. They don't last long in the sunshine. And they usually need dense foliar habitat to hide in. So ivy is kind of like perfect snail habitat. And uh, that's why if you're having trouble with snails in your vegetable gardens near an ivy patch, that's probably where their snails are living. So one of the best ways to get rid of them is just go at night and crush them. Uh, it's a little heartless feeling maybe, but it's very effective and there's no uh, pesticide residues or anything like that. Uh, you can bait in place in a plate if you're using uh, you know, a conventional type material. There is an organic material called sluggo, which Kate knows a little bit about, and maybe she'll mention it. Using copper foil around uh, the, the beds is also pretty good. The snails can't really crush copper. It's sort of like vampires and holy water, I guess. It, it's one of these things that uh, if they try to cross a copper plate, it cr creates a, 
uncomfortable electrical current that uh, they don't like. Uh, chickens will certainly eat them. And if you have friends, I suppose you could probably uh, purify them. You can put them on a diet of cornmeal and some other things and eventually eat them. And uh, I've had snails before in France, and I, I think they're just basically a good carrier for garlic and butter. I don't, and herbs, I, there's really not a lot to, to, to chew on there, uh, but it is something that's considered to be sort of gourmet in some circles. While you're navigating back, I just have a, uh, there's a couple of real quick questions. Is there a brand of tensiometer that you recommend or any particular tools for measuring moisture content that you prefer? Yeah, there's a company called Irometer out of uh, Santa Barbara, and they, they come in different depths. And, and I think for most gardeners, having one at eight inches or 12 inches or maybe two of them would be really useful. And uh, uh, they're, they're a little expensive initially, but they last a long time. So uh, that's what I'd recommend. Okay. Kate, looks like you're ready to go. So, um, so I'm going to talk more in, um, in practical terms about drip irrigation and how that, um, how we as gardeners can uh, efficiently utilize it. So I think the first thing to do is to talk about the, why, why use drip irrigation. It's really a super easy, efficient way to water. It's water to the roots of the zone of the plants. Um, weeds are minimized during the dry season. So once the rain stops, Basically, the, a lot of weeds will minimize growth or stop germination as the soil really dries. Plants are about 20% more productive with drip irrigation because of the water that is focused on the, their root zones. So uh, with vegetable gardens, this is, is uh, important to us. There's less disease issues as foli foliage remains dry. Um, is there's little to no evaporation. Watering could happen when schedules dictate. So some, it's best to water in the evening or early morning, but if watering schedules dictate that it needs to be during the day, you're not having water loss from evaporation. It, once you get your system set up, it's so easy, time-saving. Uh, these should be, um, drip systems should be used in conjunction with a timer. Um, battery timers work great if you don't have an electronic timer, and I'm going to show you an example of that. So different, different um, types of systems, and we'll look at different types of drip systems, put out different amounts of water per hour, and that's called, referred to as gallons per hour. And so run times, um, irrigation run times need adjusting uh, accordingly. So we'll, we'll talk more about these. So we want to, um, to use a measured um, grid system. Uh, and so that this, instead of using a squiggle, I see the, like the squiggles everywhere and the squiggles then <laughs> are changed from year to year and, and crop to crop. Um, whereas these grid systems, you would set up your bed. So if these are raised, um, if these are boxes, raised boxes, large or small, you just make a, a line, put lines down the bed uh, lengthwise, because going lengthwise allow you, um, allows you to use less parts, rather than if you went widthwise, you'd have a lot more lines. So you always want to look for the most efficient way to set up your system. And this stays the same um, from year to year. So you could plant just one line of tomatoes in this bed, or you could do three or four lines of, say, carrots. And so the, the bed is fully wetted, and, um, and so um, and you're using the same, the same parts in every bed. So going, buying parts or fixing things becomes, um, is, uh, is very easy and, and efficient. Um, this is from, I mentioned before, the company Dripworks. Uh, their, their website, their catalogs are just full of technical information and schematics, so there's everything that you need to um, know, every part that for setting up a system like this or other systems. And so you'll, the names are there for easy ordering or asking questions. Um, so really, again, highly recommended to go on their website or, or get one of their catalogs. So hydrozoning is, uh, is important. 
um, for any irrigation system, and that's simply grouping the same the plants plants together that require the same amounts of water. So your in-ground system would be on one um, one timer or one station, and ra the raised boxes would be on another. So they would run at separate times because they have different watering needs. So the, the boxes are going to need water probably every day in the summer when it's really hot, and in the spring maybe every other day because these drain very, very quickly. They heat up quickly. There's kind of more surface area per bed. Um, and um, another thing to know about container gardening is you need a, a large enough volume of soil area in hot areas. Uh, so both for roots and also so the bed doesn't, the container doesn't heat up and dry out uh, too quickly, like, uh, like something as large as a wine barrel, half a wine barrel would be, um, would be the minimum. Uh, also, there's been continuing questions about fertilizer and compost. So before you plant each year, you will want to um, top dress these boxes or your beds with uh, fertilizer and compost. And if you are gardening year round, it would you would probably want to do this twice. So in the spring and, and then for your spring and summer planting and then again in the fall. And um, there are a lot of, um, of boxed uh, or bagged fertilizers available, complete fertilizers. Some of them are recommended for vegetables or roses. Uh, other people like to kind of mix their own. And uh, I had mentioned my favorite fertilizer is a uh, feather meal. So ground chicken feathers and it's all, this is all nitrogen. So you uh, would need to use this in conjunction with other uh, fertilizers or uh, really good compost. And so these boxes are usually um, watered with uh, the spaghetti tubing, and we'll look at that, whereas there's a, a lot of different options for uh, in-ground systems. We don't want to mix water distribution systems. This bed has both sprayers and drippers mixed, um, and so the drippers are putting out a, um, a much lower volume of water per hour than the sprayers. Uh, so the sprayers, I don't know what the irrigation scheduling is, but uh, the sprayers uh, are just are on far too long and it's just drowning these watermelons. Uh, so you really want to only use sprayers or only use uh, drippers. And so, uh, so as to be able to um, construct your, your watering schedule uh, efficiently. So this is um, a drip tape. And, uh, and so this is often used in large agricultural situations. Water weeps out very slowly. It's a low pressure system. Uh, so it runs from about two to, or four to 15 pounds pressure or pounds per square inch. Uh, so these do need to be used in conjunction with a uh, pressure regulator. A lot of pressure regulators, there's uh, really large ones that you would put on a, a large irrigation manifold. And then there's just ones, smaller ones that you can buy that just screw onto the end of a, a faucet or below your, uh, your uh, irrigation, your battery timer. And I do have photos of those coming up and I'm not sure what my computer saved and it, it didn't. So hopefully we'll get a chance to see those. So the water weeps out of here very, very slowly. On the left, it's probably been on for five or 10 minutes. On the right, about 35 minutes. And so your watering, uh, so your watering schedule is going to change over the season. And uh, in the early part of the season, uh, you'll probably be watering, say, like every other day. And then in, as the season gets hot for hot areas, you might want to add on um, one more day of the week. So rather than so you might start with Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then, uh, and then when it gets really hot, you might want to add Saturday or Sunday uh, onto that schedule. As Glenn mentioned, and if you have raised boxes or containers, you will probably need to water those every day for a short time. So uh, irrigation run times are often referred to as um, the duration of, uh, of time the water is running. 
and then the intervals or the intervals between watering. So that would be, at, say, an uh, every other day schedule. So there'd be a day in between waterings. And so these, again, should be adjusted accordingly. As Glenn mentioned, you want to use a screwdriver or a tool of some kind and check the moisture levels in your soil. This is really the best way and adjust as needed. So this whole garden uses emitter tubing. This is half inch poly drip line with, with um, one gallon per hour emitters uh, spaced in the line every, this in this instance, I think it's every foot, uh, but they come in different inline spacings from nine inches uh, to I think about three feet. And these, uh, the emitters that are in line are um, usually the one gallon per hour emitters and they're pressure compensating. So when you see PC, that means that um, the emitters at the beginning of the line or the end of the line or uphill or downhill are all putting out exactly one gallon per hour of water. Uh, uh, so I like to use one gallon an hour as a standard everywhere when I'm using um, this emitter tubing or drippers. So I don't have to remember one area has half a gallon per hour, the other has two gallons per hour and get things. And so I'm trying to avoid getting things mixed up and, uh, and having an inefficient system. So th this is really, this line is, is really excellent uh, and long lasting uh, and uh, is used extensively in uh, landscapes. So we want to, if, we if you have a hilly garden, you wanna make sure to use pressure compensating tubing because if you don't, the, uh, the emitters at the end of the, the bottom of the slope will put out more uh, water than the top of the slope. <clears throat> so a uh, quarter inch soaker line is easy and convenient for raised boxes, excuse me, uh, containers or small beds. Um, so the emitters are built into the line at measured intervals, uh, just like the, the half inch emitter tubing. Um, and so these are just great for small or irregular beds or containers. Um, it runs, it needs uh, 10 to 30 pounds per square inch or PSI. Uh, the gallons per hour varies as to uh, how much water pressure and flow uh, you have. Uh, so again, raised boxes uh, drain fast and notice the, the grid system even on this uh, triangular bed. Um, some people pop in uh, drippers, um, just uh, they've got half inch uh, poly tubing and then they put spaghetti line and a dripper at the end of it, uh, which was what was done with this garden uh, here that has uh, melons and tomatoes and and uh, sunflowers. So there's no absolute right way or wrong way. It, it depends on your preference and it depends on uh, what uh, you're looking for. So let's see, let me go back and just spend a couple minutes on, um, on weeds. Uh, so I'm gonna have to figure out exactly where. Okay, so, so we were, um, Talking about Bermuda grass, uh, this, this lawn, um, this garden area was full of Bermuda grass. We wanted to plant a garden into it immediately. We didn't want to spray. So we had it rototilled and then we covered it with black plastic. Uh, I cut a hole at each plant location and then fished around and, um, and dug out the Bermuda grass at each location and then planted uh, and uh, planted into uh, each hole. And then um, one year later, the Bermuda grass is completely dead. 95% of the bindweed that was also there uh, is dead. And so this, this system, um, though some people don't like to use black plastic, enabled a really profuse and productive garden. And I spent about an hour weeding uh, that entire summer. So this was almost a, uh, a no maintenance garden. And the, the drip system was underneath, is underneath the, uh, the black plastic. Um, so bindweed is a big problem for a lot of people. And so bindweed grows in compact, compacted soil conditions. You wanna mulch it away. Uh, if you remove the conditions that it thrives in, 
uh, it will diminish in strength over time. So you want to weed it regularly and don't let it go to seed. Uh, and so this, this um, pathway that looks immaculate was almost 100% Bermuda grass, probably 10 years before. And I, I uh, assiduously weeded this uh, all summer and then um, uh, and didn't allow any bindweed to go to seed. And now 10 years later, there's, there's none. Uh, and the soil is really super loose uh, underneath those wood chips. So unfortunately, I think the solarization um, slides didn't survive whatever my computer did, but I just want to talk about it. Um, so we had talked about getting rid of uh, different ways of getting rid of Bermuda grass and weeds. And so uh, the use, on the UC IPM website, uh, there are, uh, there's a really good information uh, sheet called uh, soil sterilization. And basically soil sterilization is often used for, um, for uh, pest and disease control uh, in the soil for plants. You may have seen it sometimes used in strawberries. Um, but, uh, and so it kills um, uh, plant pests and diseases and uh, nematodes simply by the process of heating up the soil. So clear plastic is put on the soil uh, and then it's in the heat of the summer and it's left on the soil for about uh, uh, 10 weeks to 12, 10 to 12 weeks. This effectively bakes these uh, pests and diseases, but it also bakes Bermuda grass. However, you need full sun. Uh, you really have to wait till probably June 1st to uh, do this. If you have any shaded areas or if you're in a coastal area, uh, this may not work. When and what to use for fertilizing, uh, you got a lot of choices. And if, if everything is perfect, uh, compost alone might do it for you. Uh, it de but it depends a lot on the compost because a lot of compost that you get uh, from say that, that might be recycled green waste may not have a real high uh, carbon nitrogen or, or, or an adequate carbon nitrogen ratio. There may be too much carbon and not enough nitrogen. So while they make a really good soil amendment, uh, they may not have enough nutrients left over to really help your crop. So you, you have to have kind of a sense. And uh, if you're buying from some places, they, they will tell you this is really meant to be a, an amendment for vegetable gardens and it'll supply most of the nutrients that you need. They sometimes call them high test compost. Uh, but if you need to add fertilizer, you need to then decide what kind of a program you want to go on. And uh, most people like and understand dry fertilizers, but there's also liquid fertilizers that you can also use. Uh, I'm not a fan of compost teas and some people had great successes with it, but the whole point of compost is a lot of times the nutrients that are in compost are kind of held uh, in the organic matter. And for them to really become available, you have to have biological activity from uh, bacteria, fungi, and actinomyces to release the nutrients. So you can make tea out of it and it may be nice and brown and everything, but that doesn't mean you're really taking out enough nutrients to, to do any good for you. But other people are big fans and they, they use it regularly and they have some success. There's also the idea, do I, treat the foliage or do I treat the soil? And leaves are not really designed to absorb nutrients, they're designed to absorb sunshine. And uh, consequently, I'm not a big foliar fan, but again, uh, sometimes there's, in a pinch, you might need to green stuff up if, so, if, if you feel like your uh, plants need a tonic and there's, there's different things to use. Um, there's chemical fertilizer, certainly, but most of the time, uh, people growing in the back gardens want to be more organic. And if that's the case, uh, fish emulsion is a very good material to use, but it tends to be absorbed fairly well by the foliage of plants. I generally say uh, avoid manures unless they're well composted. So uh, there, there's the pathogenic aspects of it. And there's also another issue, which is that steer manure, which you can often buy in the sack very cheap. Uh, there, it's coming off of feedlots or, or you know, some sort of an intensive animal facility and there's a good chance that there's going to be salt in there if it's from a feedlot because they try to get the animals to to drink a lot of water so that they'll gain weight and if it's coming off of uh you know some other animal 
facility could also have antibiotics in it and things. So unless it's been really well composted and we've had time for everything to degrade, uh, I wouldn't recommend using anything that was straight manure that, that hasn't been well composted. And typically a, a good compost period for, for animal manures is about uh, probably six months. And we'd like to see that pile get really good and hot so that you got all the pathogens out. So you need to get it up to about 140 degrees to kill off most pathogens uh, that, are, that could be in manure. So organic uh, granular fertilizers, Kate talked a lot about this. Often feather meal and other animal byproducts are put into it. Uh, so if you're a vegan, you probably don't want to use these. But uh, there's a lot of feathers around because we eat a lot of chicken in the United States. So what they do with the feathers is they, they put them through a, a process of, of uh, kind of uh, high steam and, and then they, they uh, cook them and then chop them up and, and uh, get them granulated. So they're, they're a time release fertilizer. They, they're, the principal ingredient is keratin and it takes a little while for that keratin to break down. So they depend on biological activity. Uh, so it's, it's nice because I mean, one application is probably gonna release nitrogen over 10 to 12 weeks. And a lot of times that's the, the course of your, your vegetable garden. So you can put on a pretty good application of this and you got it for the season. However, you need to bury it beneath the drip emitter uh, near the roots of the plant or mix it in, in the pre-plant mix if you're uh, gonna go into containers. Just to reiterate what we said about containers, if you're in the interior, the, the smallest size container I would recommend is probably half of a wine barrel because anything smaller than that just gets too hot, the roots heat up. Roots of plants generally don't like to get above about 75 degrees and they start to go in distress. And even if you're watering, they still go in distress. So we find in the, the warmer interior parts of, of our region that we're, we need bigger containers. So, uh, people use all sorts of different things, but make them big. Um, you know, it's kind of a, an offshoot from the, the cannabis industry. You can buy very nice big plastic bags if you want for your tomato plants and uh, fill them with, with a, a premixed soil. But the important thing is if you're gonna do um, containers, make sure that, they're, that you've got a fair amount of volume because otherwise the soil just gets too warm in the heat. Okay, so uh, the rates vary. You really have to follow the label on this. Um, so there, there are three numbers you usually see, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK. Most of the time for organic fertilizers, those numbers are gonna be pretty low. The, the good thing though about organic fertilizers though is that they're time release. So they don't go instantly into solution compared to like chemical fertilizers, which a lot of them are designed to go into solution very fast. So you get a rapid response. But things that solubilize rapidly also disappear rapidly. Uh, and then I also want to talk a little bit just briefly about watering. Uh, so, so if, you know, there's some people that's, that say, well, I water deep and infrequently. And, you know, that is a good strategy, I think, for trees. But when we're talking about vegetables, the problem if we start doing deep and frequent irrigations is that, A, we could stress our plants. And more importantly, a lot of times we're trying to keep a pretty high level of fertilizer in the upper uh, 6 to 12 inches of soil because that's where most of the vegetable roots are. That's about 75% of them are in that first 12 inches of soil. So if you water too much, you're gonna leach whatever fertilizer is in the soil right through. So this is something that uh, the light frequent irrigation is a better way to go because especially with these organic fertilizers, they're mineralizing uh, at a kind of a, a moderate rate over 10 to 12 weeks. And if you, if you irrigate heavy, you wash all the nutrients right out. So uh, you wanna kind of be careful that the light frequent irrigations is a better way to go if you're working with organic fertilizers. Now, we also have the option for organic liquid fertilizers. A lot of times these act fairly quickly and uh, you know, because they are more soluble and we have to apply these maybe through the drip system you can do that, be careful that you can clog the system if the, if the material is not small enough. So we usually recommend to inject before you filter. And I'm just going to talk briefly about filters because if you're on city water, it's not a big issue for you. Um, so I still recommend that every single system have a filter. And Kate didn't mention it much because she probably has nice water, but I don't. My water is surface water and it has a lot of algae in it. So even though I have main filters, 
every single one of my lateral lines has a little filter as well and a fairly fine little filter because what you don't want to do is clog up your emitters. So part of my, my weekly garden routine is that I clean filters. They're just, I use the little lateral ones that, that screw on a hose bib and uh, I take out and brush and put them back in. And sure enough, there's usually a fair amount of algae in there because you just can't screen all this stuff. And then sometimes it also grows in your system. So in order to keep your emitters in good shape, you want to be sure that everything is filtered. And uh, I, I'm all for filtration. They're not expensive. A little lateral filter that you can put on um, your systems, they, they go for about under $15 and they're well worth uh, doing. Now, going back to liquid fertilizers, you can see over here, this is called a hose-on proportioner. And uh, you can see a bucket with concentrated fertilizer. And these things are kind of preset. They, they range from, for, uh, as you're running the water, they will, will suck up somewhere between one gallon for every 20 gallons, go through here, up to uh, one gallon of material for 50 gallons that goes through here. So you have to know a little bit about your proportioner. These were designed probably more for, for chemical fertilization, uh, which in the case of a lot of our commercial nurseries in California, that, that's used heavily. They uh, fertilize almost exclusively with water-based soluble fertilizers. And they're wonderful because they're instantly available. And you notice uh, nursery plants always look fluffy and green and beautiful. And that's part of the reason why is they have very high levels of fer fertility. The downside of that is, is underneath every nursery in California, practically, especially old nurseries, is this giant plume of water pollution because they, they really couldn't contain it. So, so now almost every single nursery in California has a, a big polyethylene liner underneath it where, and then they put gravel on top of that and it's sloped and they capture the water when they irrigate and they uh, will, will treat it with a little bit of chlorine and send it back into their system as a way of minimizing water, groundwater pollution. We can use uh, organic fertilizers this way, but you gotta make sure again that they're gonna go through the filter. That's kind of the key thing. And, and liquid fertilization is great. We use it, <coughs> excuse me, in the, in the vineyard industry and in organic vineyards. And it's a nice way to be able to apply uh, nutrients that, that sometimes are a little bit hard to get uh, into the soil exactly where you need them in the root system. So uh, I, I like liquid feeding, but with a few caveats that A, we don't have a lot of choices for organics. And uh, B, if you're gonna use a, a system like that, it, a lot of times you're, you're basically fertilizing a little bit every time you irrigate. So that's kind of the, the model that the nursery industry uses. Uh, watering cans are also helpful if you've just got a small garden and, and you need to perk stuff up. Again, fish emulsion fertilizer, there's other organic fertilizers that are soluble that you can use. The cannabis industry's brought us all sorts of amazing products, some of them very expensive, but also some of them very highly effective uh, that, that you can use also for your vegetables as well. And uh, the cannabis industry relies very heavily on high fertility to really get the kind of growth that they want. So um, the, these are some of the options that you have. That's basically it uh, on Perfect. our organic liquid and fertilizers. Awesome. Kate, do you have okay, anything to add? Um, I, I, um, I like the granular fertilizers. Um, I prefer them because uh, it's kind of a one, one shot application when you're uh, preparing your soil and putting your compost down in the spring or the fall. And then, then I don't have to think about it for the whole rest of the summer. So um, so that, that's, I like to make gardens as easy to, uh, to manage and, and care for as possible. So that, but I know a lot of people do like uh, liquid fertilizers. So again, it's, it's an indi individual preference. Great. Okay, um, we're getting low on time. Kate, do you wanna uh, finish off uh, with your talk about beneficial insects? Yeah, while you're getting that loaded, I'm just gonna mention there's a lot of questions about managing weeds and um, you know, how to deal with, with different types of weeds. And I'm, I, I, we don't have time to address those questions today, but I will say that the UC IPM website that we keep talking about is just an excellent resource for, for um, in, uh, addressing those questions. So please check that out. At, after Kate's done with the presentation, uh, maybe uh, they'll, our specialists will have some other options for resources to take advantage of. But right now, uh, we're gonna uh, 
have Kate talk about uh, pest control and, and beneficial insects. Basically with pest control, prevention is the best. We've talked a lot about um, creating uh, healthy, happy gardens with uh, compost, attention to compost and fertilizer and, and watering regularly. Uh, and so you really want to uh, keep your plants uh, happy, growing well, and uh, because stressed plants are, are more attractive to pests. Uh, uh, we, if you have a repeat problem plant, it may be better to plant um, a different variety or plant types instead. Um, know that some pest issues are seasonal, like aphids in the spring, uh, which then uh, the problem will diminish over the summer as temperatures rise, humidity drops, and plant tissues harden. Uh, you want to minimize dust, um, in, especially in hot inland areas. So for spider mite control, they like they uh, thrive in, in uh, hot, dry, dusty conditions. We want to control weeds in our garden year-round. A lot weeds can be uh, hosts for pests or um, or diseases. And uh, and keep your garden free of, of plant debris. Uh, so after harvest is finished, I remove the spent plants and they're either composted or uh, green binned. We want to rotate beds with different plant species each year. Uh, bait for slugs and snails with non-toxic uh, baits like sluggo. There's a sluggo plus if uh, pill bugs and earwigs are an issue. You could put this on, uh, on little jar lids so it doesn't touch the soil and put inverted strawberry baskets on top to keep anything from eating it. Uh, you could hand pick large bugs off early in the morning when it's cool. And then you, you wanna plant a lot of plants for beneficial insects. Uh, so like one or two plants will not do it. You want to plant as many as you possibly can. And I'll have some photos of that coming up. Uh, some, um, so some natural enemies, so some examples like are, they really vary. There isn't sort of one and, or one type. You really want to look, try to have a, uh, as many as you possibly can in your garden. And that's achieved through, uh, through planting plants for uh, like alyssum or cilantro is, is wonderful uh, or Leia for um, because a lot of these uh, beneficial insects as adults also feed on flower nectar. So some um, natural enemies like spiders are generalists, they will capture anything. So others like tiny parasitic wasps target very specific prey like caterpillars, say stink bug eggs or insect eggs or aphids. So they're, they're, um, they don't prey on any insect, they are very specific. Uh, large, the large solitary wasps are, they're non-social, they're non-defensive, will hunt, often hunt specific prey like spiders or caterpillars. So these are wonderful in your garden and they, they also feed on flower nectar as well. Um, lacewing and ladybug larvae are voracious predators, but adult lacewings only feed on uh, nectar as do adult hoverflies. Uh, so again, those flowers are really important. Um, and so, and hoverfly uh, uh, larvae are predatory. They feed on, so they're those, um, they're basically sort of fly maggots type creatures. They feed on soft bodied insects like aphids. And let's not discount birds. 93% of birds feed their young um, insects. Uh, so let's see. So alyssum is, is really by far the easiest plant for beneficial insects, it really, it flowers all summer. You don't have to replant. Uh, it, um, it's just, is really great. And you could, it could be sort of stuffed in corners or underneath other plants. It is an annual uh, and it will recede in places that don't have uh, too much uh, frost in the summer. So interestingly, bees or pollinators don't, don't uh, visit Alyssa much. You really mainly see uh, predatory insects uh, visiting it. So uh, cilantro is also a great plant for pollinators and beneficial insects. It's short-lived, it's a summer annual, so you would have to plant it every few weeks. And that may be a lot of work for some people, but uh, on the other hand, the amount of life that visits it is just truly amazing. Orlea is a hardy annual that is also used as a cut flower. 
uh, it doesn't live all summer in, um, so maybe need to be replanted uh, maybe twice. Uh, but again, beautiful plant. Um, so here's just some examples of a few um, of what is sort of going on under our noses and in gardens. Uh, this, this is the underside of a charred leaf and they're aphids that were brown and we looked a little more closely and then saw that they, each one of them had a hole in them and we realized they had been parasitized. And then we looked further and it was these uh, tiny, these are the tiny parasitoid wasps that are laying eggs in uh, the aphids with an uh, overpositor and then the larva will hatch and so literally gruesomely eat the aphid from the inside and then um, pupate and emerge as uh, fully formed in a, as an adult. So there's all kinds of these relationships going on uh, under our noses uh, in gardens. And, uh, and so we just need to uh, plant plants like so here's a, a lissum planted at the end of these vegetable beds uh, and, um, and they, will, they will come. And a lot of these plants here are, these are all pollinator friendly plants a whole variety of annuals and perennials. So these are planted around the margins of these, um, of these vegetable beds. And so this is something we could all do and make our gardens look, uh, look beautiful and, uh, and at the same time uh, create a healthy environment for both bees of all varieties and, uh, and uh, beneficial insects. And I think that is that wraps it up. Awesome. Well, we're a little behind, but I think this is really interesting and a good discussion. I just have a couple things to add about beneficial insects and pollinators. As an entomologist, I actually have something to contribute finally to the discussion. Um, <laughs> it's really important to think about resources for pollinators and beneficial insects, right? As Kate mentioned, um, parasitoid adults are, are sugar feeders. They feed on nectar and they're pollinators, so they need flower resources as well. So it's, it's uh, important to first provide those resources, but also to think about it in a spatial and temporal scale. Uh, you know, you need blooming resources throughout the year. So think about planting things that bloom early in the season, support native pollinators and predators during the summer and then fall. So you want resources available year round. It's not, you know, a good idea to have everything bloom out at once. You need constant sources of, res of food for these insects to keep them in your garden year round. And also diversity. The more diverse your garden is, the more you will support a more diverse insect habitat, which um, will help, you know, encourage and support those those beneficial insects as well. So um, I, I know we just barely touched on insect issues. I think that was a great summary. Again, that UC IPM website has just an immense amount of information on pest control, integrated pest management talking about pest control and additional weed issues, as well as beneficial insects. So supporting honeybees as well as native pollinators. So check that resource out. Um, uh, I also posted a link to another uh, website called the Xerces, Xer Xerces Society, which just is, is a phenomenal resource for information on supporting pollinators and beneficial insects in your garden. Um, do you have any other resources you can recommend and maybe might be okay if we go a little bit, a few minutes over today, just to f continue this discussion, but other resources you might recommend. And then uh, there's a couple of questions that I want to get to that I thought were pretty interesting and, and for asking a couple of times. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say just a little bit more about the UC IPM website. Um, sure. The U UC, it, so it has, so not only information about the specific uh, beneficial insects, but you could also look up each vegetable individually and then it has oh, just there's so much information about how to grow them and mm -hmm. uh, crop needs but also p uh, pests common pests that um, that visit that are issues with uh, vegetables and and what to do about it so really it tells you a lot of information about the life cycle of the pest because sometimes just knowing uh, that will really uh, help again help with prevention of the the issue Another interesting source of information for you is to go to UC Davis VRIC, which stands for Vegetable Research Information Center. And they, it's geared a little bit more towards commercial growers, but there's still a lot of information about vegetables on that. Uh, and it's a good site for you to, to find out uh, uh, information on specific vegetable species. Um, so that's one that I, that I have used in the past. I hope it's still valid. Are you checking it, Michael? Or? 
Yeah, I just I'm gonna post the link right now. Okay. That's one I like to go to. You, it, it gets uh, a little technical in some places, but there's a lot of really good information on uh, commercial crops in there, and and uh, we'll talk a little bit about specific cultivars in some cases and fertilizing and pests and and other things. And again, it doesn't appear often. Uh, for home vegetable gardeners uh, information, but it's a good place to go to if you want more detailed info. Yeah, it's, it's a good website as well. Um, so a couple, a couple of things that came up a few times that I thought would be interesting to address is you were talking about water quality, particularly like filtering out particulates, but a couple of people asked about, you know, municipal water typically is chlorinated and if there's any issues with you know chlorination in the soil and impacts it has on the plants or if there's a way to um, mitigate those impacts if they are going to be a problem any kind of ideas or resources they can check in about that well i it's of course we chlorinate to keep things healthy and it's at a fairly low rate it's about one part per million so at one part per million obviously it's safe for us to drink and in fact it's better for you to be drinking that than drinking bacteria and that's why we use <laughs> yeah, it yeah right uh, yeah. and, and as it hits the soil, it's usually uh, picked up pretty quickly by organic matter if you're using a fair amount of organic matter and held on to. It, it is there for good. Um, in other words, it does, well, it, it can evaporate. So it, it, but at, you know, when it hits the soil at, at the rates we're, we're dealing with, it, it's not a problem. You know, you got to get up okay. into much higher ranges. So I would not sweat the chlorine. Um, and the, the flip side of that is it's, really good for your emitters too because at one part per million going through these these micro irrigation systems it kills a lot of algae and other stuff that might accumulate in there mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, it, it's it's useful uh, the the unfortunate thing is that for organic certification you're not allowed to to use chlorine to to clean the lines but that's usually at much higher rates and they usually do allow municipal uh treated water in organic uh, certification systems because it's at such a low rate. They don't encourage it, but mm -hmm. they would still allow it. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of questions on fertilizers, but again, that, that first workshop we had, we really went into it, Kate and Glenn really went into a deep discussion on, on fertilizers. So if you have additional questions, refer back to that workshop. Hopefully those questions, your, your questions will be answered. Um, there was one that I don't think we talked about, but somebody said they inherited, you know, old compost, old sacks of compost. Is there a shelf life for the efficacy? I'd imagine that if stuff starts to degrade and break down in nutrient value. Is there a kind of a lifespan for bags of fertilizer? Uh, if, if it's a sealed bag, you know, with plastic and such, uh, and it yeah. hasn't been exposed to water, it's 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 good for a long, long time. So uh, some of these things are, are kind of volatile. You can lose nitrogen and such uh, in compost that's stored out in the sun, but when it's uh, kind of protected like that, it's going to be good for a long, long time. Perfect. I, there, I thought there was just a funny question that I wanted to ask. Um, somebody said, how do you stop your dogs from eating the soil when you use feather meal? I suppose with just like, with any other type of vertebrate pest, you need to keep fencing or keep them out of the garden, but I, it was pretty funny. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to, I meant to address that the other day when we were talking about feather meal is um, uh, dogs will do like to eat it and some more so than others. And so um, it, the attraction of it seems to dissipate over about a week or so. And, um, and so our, our dogs lose interest after about a week, but we do have okay. our vegetable garden fenced off uh, because they, our, our dogs do become ill when they eat it. So it's really, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, so this is, well, well it, it go goes, ahead. it goes into dog food. You know, I mean, that that's one of the ingredients when you, when you see a uh, dog food made from, from chicken byproducts, a lot of times that's what they're talking about is feather meals. So that's where Fido's kind of getting his uh, taste for it. <laughs> yeah um that's funny that's great uh in the, it, it, the last few minutes there's been some discussion about earthworms about using them to help you know um you know the, the beneficial uh, 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 uh use of earthworms for compost and for their soil um 
Somebody mentioned they just buy earthworms from bait shops and, and things like that. And I, my personal preference is probably not a good idea. You want to make sure that you're sourcing local earthworm. Uh, for example, the Northeast is completely invaded with invasive earthworms and it's having these huge impacts on the, the ecosystems. Um, but what do you, what do you think about earthworms, you know, supplemental, um, um, supplementing your garden with earthworms? Well, I, I always go back to the, create the conditions for earthworms to, to thrive because earthworms are really a, um, a sort of a sign of, uh, of healthy soil and, uh, and health. Mm -hmm. And um, so soil with organic, adequate organic matter in it, um, a lack of compaction. And so, so compost uh, once or twice a year and mulch really create conditions that, um, that earthworms will thrive in. And so, so you can have them for, for free instead of buying them and they're local. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So basically the organic matter is, is food for the earthworms. And mm -hmm. so, so compost really has many benefits. So, so my understanding is that we, we have a lot of uh, uh, invasive earthworms mm -hmm. in our garden that were introduced here kind of as bait worms, just as people are talking about. And they're, I guess the red worm is their common name. And our native mm -hmm. earthworms are kind of out like in the oak forests and stuff. And they're really tough. And they, they, the red worms don't go out there that much because they can't make it as easily as they can in the garden. They like to have lots of organic matter and moisture and stuff. So uh, my understanding is that we'll find our red worms are, are pretty distributed in cultivated agricultural areas on good soil. But as we start getting into more native chaparral and such, you're not going to find them because they aren't tough enough to survive. Uh, there's okay. also night crawlers. Night crawlers are also kind of wonderful because they'll, again, they're introduced species, but they'll come up at night and they uh, will kind of uh, go after decaying organic matter and stuff and bring it down in their burrows and recycle it. So I know that uh, Bob Bug, who is kind of a, uh, he's retired now, but he was one of our, our wonderful uh, agroecology specialists, talked a lot about how uh, earthworms are really wonderful for recycling organic matter and improving uh, soil quality. So uh, they make these big channels of water goes down. So they're, they're good to have. And, and the reality is they're kind of uh, naturalized now, even though they're invasive and they tend to be in our right. gardens. And I, I agree with Kate, if, if you, you just start improving the soil with organic matter, they kind of show up and, and you don't really have to go through a lot of rigmarole to get them established. Okay. Um, well, that we're uh, we're doing pretty well. We're a couple minutes over. Any, I think that's most of the questions I wanted to get to. Like I mentioned, a lot of the, uh, bu the bulk of the questions were really specific about weed and pest control, which can be addressed if people visit the UC IPM website. Um, Ryan also posted the fruit and UC a and R fruit and tree website. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of resources out there. If you have specific questions, you can always contact your local master gardeners. Uh, so with the last couple of minutes, is there any additional last minute thoughts or things you want to say before we sign off? Well, I just, uh, I, I'm really happy to share this with everyone. Uh, you know, Kate and I have been at this a long time. And in the case of me, um, I'm going to be calling it quits here. I'm retiring on the 1st of July. So uh, it's, it's been really wonderful to have one last chance to talk to gardeners. Uh, the Master Gardener Program is a wonderful resource, uh, not only to, to uh, call, but also to become, and we have a very active groups in, in Mendocino and uh, Lake counties. We have two groups in Mendocino, one on the coast, one on the interior. So we do our trainings every other year. Uh, Lake County, I believe, is hiring a coordinator to replace Gabriella, who's been just excellent. Uh, and uh, Humboldt County also is, is starting up their Master Gardener program again, and I encourage you to, to use the Master Gardener program both for training and, and for information. Yeah, well, I, as, um, as Glenn mentioned, the, the best fertilizer for a garden is, is uh, your footprints. And I think this, <laughs> I, I think that uh, spending time in your garden and, and going out and observing how the plants are growing and what's visiting them and what's visiting the flowers uh, is just an endlessly uh, fascinating and wonderful pastime. And um, I think harvesting is, is yet another thing, but I love spending time in the plants and 
and just uh, watching them grow, basically. And I think, uh, especially in these times, there's quite a lot of pleasure to be gained from that. And in, as in the picture below, these gar vegetable gardens can be absolutely beautiful places. Your gardens, your home gardens can be fulfilling and entertaining and productive in, in many, many ways. So uh, we're all yeah. on a wonderful journey. That's awesome. Glenn, there was a request for you to write a book. <laughs> Kate's already done and it. And she's way better gardener than me. Yeah. No, check out Kate's books for sure. Uh, there's a lot of people were saying, hey, will there be more programs like this? Um, I think we've already asked enough of Glenn and Kate, but I will point out that there's master gardener programs around the state that are hosting the very, very similar workshop series that you can check out. Um, you know, visit the UC uh, Master Gardener website. Uh, and also there's a UC in our Master Gardener YouTube channel um, that has uh, videos posted on, on a variety of topics, really great resource as well for uh, videos just like this series. So I wanna thank Glenn and Kate and, and Greg for coming, coming today. Um, this has been just a phenomenal series. As a hobbyist gardener, I've learned a lot and I think everybody else is really grateful for the information you provided. Glenn, we appreciate you doing one last show. Um, this has been awesome. It's, it's great that you're, you're sharing your knowledge with, with the, the next generation of gardeners. Um, so with that, if, um, if there's anything else, I think we'll sign off. I just want to say happy Mother's Day. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a great audience. We've had over 350 people register for these workshops. Remember that all of the resources that we're talking about today in the videos are posted online. And so you can view these videos um, at a later date and catch old information that we talked about before.